Straight ahead on Law & Crime Daily, R. Kelly survivors react to the disgraced singer's 30-year sentence. I'm grateful that Robert Sylvester Kelly is away, will stay away, and will not be able to harm anyone else. And Missouri versus Rebecca Rood. Why, why were you looking at alternative housing arrangements? Due to mainly the fact that she was targeting myself. The victim's adopted mother testifies as her biological mother stands trial for the murder of her daughter. Plus, four arrests are made after dozens of migrants are found dead in a tractor trailer in Texas. And later, Bill Cosby speaks out one year after he's released from prison. Long Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Long Crime Daily. I'm your host, Brian Bachman. For the first time since R. Kelly's sentence is handed down, we're hearing from survivors who say the sentence is one step closer to receiving justice. On Wednesday, Kelly was sentenced to 30 years in prison and slapped with a $100,000 fine for a string of sex crimes. Law & Crime Network extensively covered his six-week trial last fall where Kelly was convicted on nine federal counts. Notably, at the trial, multiple survivors gave testimony detailing the brutal sexual and physical violence they experienced at the hand of Kelly. At Wednesday's sentencing hearing, eight victim impact statements were presented, where survivors said Kelly lacked remorse and used his celebrity status to lure them into modern-day slavery. After the sentence was handed down, two of Kelly's survivors addressed the public. I never thought that I would be here to see him be held accountable for the atrocious things that he did to children. I don't know what else to say except that I'm grateful. I'm grateful for today. And I'm grateful that Robert Sylvester Kelly is away, will stay away, and will not be able to harm anyone else. I started this journey 30 years ago. I was 14 years old when I encountered Robert Sylvester Kelly. There wasn't a day in my life up until this moment that I actually believed that the judicial system will come through for black and brown girls. I stand here very proud of my judicial system, very proud of my fellow survivors, and very pleased with the outcome. 30 years did he do this, and 30 years is what he got. We also heard from federal prosecutors and Homeland Security agents who applauded the survivors for coming forward with their stories. Robert Kelly once said, if you're going to tell your life story, you got to be honest or don't do it. Over the course of this HSI-led multi-year investigation and six-week trial, a jury of Mr. Kelly's peers confirmed what these courageous victims have known for a very long time. Mr. Kelly is not an honest person. This man is a prolific serial predator who utilized his status as a Grammy award-winning household name with global recognition to inflict pain and anguish on so many victims. Despite numerous reports, of his destructive abuse over the years. The brazen acts of intimidation against his accusers kept him shielded from prosecution until HSI, the U.S. Attorney's Office from the Eastern District of New York and these incredible prosecutors and NYPD initiated an investigation into his criminal organization. Today's sentence is a victory that belongs to the brave victims who came forward. Despite intense public scrutiny, despite social media slander, despite threats to their own health and safety, and despite be, being asked to relive the pain of some of the most traumatic days in their lives, they told their stories and they made their voices heard. His attorneys also spoke following the hearing, saying their client maintains his innocence and plans to appeal the case. He's due back in court in September for a restitution hearing. Joining us today is law and crime legal analyst Dina Dahl and co-host Terry Austin. Dina, what appeals do you think Kelly will make, and do they seem like winnable ones to you? Well, we know that they're most likely going to appeal the RICO charge. He was convicted of the RICO charge and for sex trafficking. And it's true that it was probably a creative, um, the RICO charge was a, probably a pretty creative charge because it requires them to show that there was an enterprise and not just that these were isolated incidents. But even if he is successful in overturning that, you know, he would still have his conviction of sex trafficking and the prison time for that would stand as well. Yeah. Now, Terry, since R. Kelly and Ghislaine Maxwell were sentenced, people have compared how the judge in Maxwell went lower in her requested sentence and in Kelly went higher. Different judges, similar crimes. Is it right to compare the two? 
Well, I think we can compare the two. It is interesting. The prosecution team in the R. Kelly case asked for 25 and got 30, and the prosecution team in the Maxwell case asked for 30 and got 20. But I do think the judges, both Donnelly and Nathan, were looking at the same thing. They looked at the seriousness of the crime. They listened to the impact statements. They both applied the federal sentencing guidelines. And they both considered the trauma that they each experienced in their younger lives. So I think the analysis was the same. But at the end of the day, I do think that Kelly got a bigger sentence because he was the primary actor. And Maxwell, we all know, was the one who was facilitating and not the primary actor. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, apples and oranges, a lot of similarities, but differences nonetheless. And switching to Mississippi, where a team searching for evidence about the lynching of a black teenager, Emmett Till, found an unserved warrant for a woman charged in his 1955 kidnapping. 14-year-old Till was abducted, tortured, and lynched more than 70 years ago after being accused of flirting with Carolyn Bryant, a white woman at her family's grocery store. Two men, Bryant's husband and his brother, abducted Till, beat him, and shot him in the head before dumping his body in the Tallahatchie River. Three days later, his body was found. The two men were arrested but were ultimately acquitted by an all-white jury. Later, they publicly admitted to his killing but were protected by double jeopardy. The name on the arrest warrant found last week is Carolyn Bryant Donahan, the woman Till allegedly whistled at. Till's relatives, who initiated the search, want authorities to arrest her now 70 years later. Investigators believe a woman, possibly Bryant, identified Till to the two men who later killed him. When asked if they would prosecute the case, the prosecutor's office referenced a December report from the Justice Department, which said no prosecution of Bryant is possible. Still ahead on Law and Crime Daily, four people are arrested and charged after dozens of migrants are found dead in a smuggling incident outside of San Antonio. But first, the victim's adoptive mother testifies in the bench trial of Rebecca Rood, charged in the death of her 16-year-old daughter. Welcome back to Law and Crime. The judge hears from the victim's adoptive mother in the bench trial of Missouri versus Rebecca Rood, just before the state and defense rested Wednesday. Rood is charged with the 2017 murder of her 16-year-old daughter, Savannah Leckie, who was adopted at birth by Tamila Leckie Montagu and David Leckie, a couple who divorced shortly before Savannah's death. Savannah, who had special needs, began struggling with behavioral problems as a teen. Lecky Montague and Rood agreed to have Savannah move back in with her biological mother and her boyfriend, Robert Pete. Eleven months later, Rood reported her daughter missing. Prosecutors say Rood abused Savannah and that she and Pete eventually killed her and burned her body in June of 2017. Investigators searched their Ozark County farm and found bone fragments and teeth in a burn pile. In opening statements, Rood's attorney argued Savannah killed herself and that Rood admits to burning her daughter. On direct examination, Lecky Montague was asked what led to the decision to move Savannah elsewhere. If you look at alternative housing arrangements for Savannah, yes. was it, why, why were you looking at alternative housing arrangements? Due to mainly the fact that she was targeting myself, um, extremely combative at home, um, very, having lots of confrontations with her siblings, one of the confrontations resulted in my youngest son's father showing enough concern that he was talking about keeping him away from the home. Um, did you and David talk about where to place Savannah? Yes. All right. Did, uh, did you ask David to take Savannah? Yes. And, and was he able to? He said no. Terry, what did the prosecution get from the adoptive mother in putting her on the stand? 
You know, I think one of the things the prosecution was trying to do is show a motive. This is a very sad case. Savannah was not wanted by her real mom. She wasn't wanted by the adoptive parents. And here we have someone who has special needs. And I think the prosecution was trying to say it was a difficult person to handle, that she was getting combative, and that that was the very reason that her, her own mother, when she went back to her own mother, actually killed her. And, you know, the fact that she was a teenage and probably acting out anyway didn't make things any easier. Obviously, not an excuse to kill someone, particularly in a, this heinous way. But I do think that was the purpose of showing the adoptive mom on the stand. Yeah. T Dina, I agree with that. But the defense attorney, me, is thinking, no matter what she says about Rude, my question to her would be, but you let Savannah move in with her, right? Doesn't that mean that at some point she thought that Rebecca Rude was fit to be a mother? Yeah, absolutely. That or she has some culpability herself, some sort of at least, you know, failure to um, properly take care of her daughter. I mean, it's a really, this story just gets more and more tragic. I agree with Terry. She was failed by every single adult in her life. And the fact that they knew that she was having behavioral problems and then sent her to her adoptive mother without knowing whether or not her adoptive mother could handle it, which clearly she couldn't because she killed her or allegedly killed her within 11 months, which is a very short period of time. Um, it just, it shows such a failure of a care by really any of these adults. I don't know if that really helped the prosecution that much. To me, it just really showed uh, that maybe they should be doing something even about what her inaction was. There's certainly maybe several adults here who failed her. Yeah, a lot of failure to be passed around, and unfortunately, we have a young girl at the middle, but who suffered the most. Well, thank you both for your commentary. Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson becomes the first black woman Supreme Court justice when she's sworn in in Thursday afternoon. Back in April, Jackson was confirmed when the Senate voted on her nomination. This came after Justice Stephen Breyer announced his retirement. On Thursday afternoon, Jackson took a constitutional and judicial oath. This makes Jackson the 116th justice and the sixth woman to sit on the high court. Coming up on Law & Crime Daily, one year after his release from prison, Bill Cosby speaks out. Plus, four arrests are made in the deadly migrant smuggling incident out of Texas. That's ahead on Law & Crime Daily. Welcome back. Four people are arrested in connection to what authorities say is the deadliest human smuggling incident in United States history. It happened earlier this week when dozens of migrants were found dead in the back of an abandoned semi-tractor trailer. Officials say they died of heat-related illnesses and exhaustion, noting many of the bodies were hot to the touch. In all, 53 people were died. Officials say the people who were from Mexico, Guatemala, and Honduras were being transported into the country in the back of a semi without air conditioning or water. Four people have now been arrested in connection to the event. Officials say 45-year-old Homero Zamaro Jr. was the driver of the semi and pretended to be one of the injured migrants at the scene. He's now being charged with smuggling, resulting in death. Three other people were also arrested, including two Mexican men living undocumented in the country. Officials say the semi was registered to their address. Terry, based on these charges, the death penalty is on the table, especially for the smuggling resulting in death. Do you think because of the number of deaths, the prosecutors will be seeking it? Oh, absolutely. And in Texas, capital murder is the only type of felony where you can have the death penalty. And they list out all of the types of capital murder. You can have a murder for hire or if you murder someone while you're in prison on a life sentence, if you're trying to escape from prison, if you kill a judge in retaliation, if you kill a police officer or a fireman. So there are multiple types, but the very last listing type is multiple deaths. And here you have 53 deaths. No doubt about it, the prosecution should not only seek the death penalty, but they should make sure that that jury is ready to actually give the death penalty. It's hard to do, but hopefully they will be able to have a jury who can actually give the death penalty, because this is a horrible case. Yeah. Terry, I agree. Dina, viewers, hear me out for a second. Let me at least finish my sentence. Plain devil's advocate. But maybe we shouldn't give them the death penalty. Maybe we should give them lesser because, and this is the only reason why I say this, maybe we need them to flip on the people that employed them. 
Because in my mind, they have already been replaced. They already have people who are gassing up the trucks and doing this again. Don't we want, Dina, the people at the top of this chain and not at the bottom? Cer certainly we do. And that's the one way that maybe they can make some sort of arrangement, some plea deal, and not get the death penalty as put on there. I mean, it's also possible these drivers don't know that much information. Sometimes organizations like this kind of only give um, the, an employee the small amount of information they need to complete their task. So whether or not they actually have kind of the goods and can turn on the higher-ups is a big question. And if they don't, I think they will also get the death penalty, as Terry mentioned, also showing the kind of significant depravity they showed her that people, they could have put in really simple things like water bottles in the truck or, or fans in the truck. If they really cared at all about human life and the fact that they didn't, this would be a case that they were gonna apply the death penalty, I'm sure. Absolutely. Well. And down in Texas, a convicted killer is facing four new capital murder indictments. That adds to the 18 capital murder charges and two attempted capital murder charges he's already facing in the Dallas area. Accused serial killer Billy Shamir Mir now faces charges in the deaths of 22 women. Investigators initially believed his alleged victims died of natural causes. It was only after families reported stolen items and suspicious circumstances that the cases were reopened. Prosecutors say he targeted senior living communities, smothered his victims to steal from them. A retrial was held in April for one case, the murder of Lutie Harris, after the first jury was unable to reach a unanimous verdict. Jameer Mir was convicted and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. He is now in jail awaiting another trial scheduled for October. When we come back, Bill Cosby speaks out what the disgraced comedian has to say one year after his release from prison. Welcome back. Disgraced South Carolina attorney Alec Murdoch is facing even more charges in an alleged money laundering and drug scheme. Prosecutors say the once prominent lawyer was involved in an eight-year money laundering and painkiller drug ring. They say Curtis Eddie Smith was also involved in the alleged scheme. He is the friend and former client of Murdoch, who is charged with trying to help him commit suicide as part of a life insurance fraud scheme last year. The new charges allege Murdoch wrote more than 400 checks worth $2.4 million. Smith allegedly cashed them over the course of eight years, keeping some and spending the rest on a wide range of illegal activities. Prosecutors say that included a distribution network for the painkiller oxycodone. This is the 16th indictment against Murdoch, who faces a slew of charges for alleged financial crimes. Authorities are also investigating the death of Murdoch's wife and son, who were shot and killed on their family property. Murdoch denies any involvement in their deaths. The new indictment brings Murdoch's total charges to 81. And we're hearing from comedian Bill Cosby on the one-year anniversary of his release from prison. Back in 2018, the disgraced comedian was convicted of sexual assault. He was sentenced to three to ten years in prison. Last June, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court overturned Cosby's conviction. He was then released from prison. The court determined Cosby's due process rights were violated during his conviction and that an agreement with a former prosecutor meant charges shouldn't have been filed in the first place. In a radio interview, Cosby describes his release from prison, explaining what advice he gives to other people in the same situation. I also discussed that being of my race and culture, uh, many things were against us and we had to work hard to overcome these things and people became our heroes and i said heroes you, you've got to make yourself heroes and and choose the correct people to be your heroes this interview comes just one week after cosby was found liable in a decades-old sexual assault case he was ordered to pay accuser judy huff five hundred thousand dollars in damages do you know, why do you think Cosby is so happy after losing a civil case? Should he be, in your opinion? You know, I think anybody after being released from prison early because their conviction was overturned would be ecstatic. And a civil case for $500,000 for somebody like Bill Cosby is really not that much, I imagine. And he actually didn't even 
attend the civil trial because of his severe glaucoma. So really, he just had to write a check to his lawyers and then write a check for damages. And so I, I think for somebody with wealth, that really probably doesn't impact him, especially if you've been in, in prison and you've been released, you probably see that all in a very different light. I'm waiting for the day that losing $500,000 is not a big deal for me. I lose $5 and it's a, it messes up my whole week, but hey, whatever. Terry, what's your reaction to Cosby celebrating his release in this way? Well, I think he should not be celebrating, obviously. This is not a victory for him. He's out of prison, yes, and that's good for him. But it was really a procedural issue that got him out. He had this agreement with this prior prosecutor, and he wasn't, you know, they didn't abide by that agreement. And during his deposition, he made some admissions that shouldn't have been used against him. And so I think from a procedural matter, his due process was violated, and they came to the right decision. But he has no right to celebrate. From a substantive standpoint, you still have all of these accusers who are accusing him. And the way he did this with all of these individuals, using drugs and basically taking advantage of people, it's no cause for celebration. As for the civil money, look, $500,000, I think, is a lot for anybody. And, you know, that's no reason to celebrate either. So he's happy. I get it. But I think he should be more remorseful and quiet. Yeah, you know, we'll see what it does maybe on the second anniversary. Hopefully not as much of a celebration. Well, thank you both, and thank you for joining us here on Law & Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.